Coming to you live from inside of a pocket. This is Optimal Play. I'm Brandon. Uh, I thought it would be a nice night for uh, to sip whiskey and play some solo games. Ooh, I gotta get that first sip out of the way. Uh, I don't have any ice in the game room, so drinking this neat. Uh, we'll see how that serves me. Uh, anyway, I'm um, dragging my feet getting to the big news. The new Gloomhaven is out, and I am going to play some solo for you. Let me go get the... the... Ah. This is it. It's Gloomhaven, Buttons and Bugs. It looks like... It looks like a cute little diorama version of Gloomhaven that like someone would make as a, as a cute hobby project or something. Like It's kind of got the same dimensions, like, like uh, ratios, as... The Gloomhaven box you know, it's just itty bitty. And the game looks like this. We'll have a map on the table in a second, but you can see my hands. This game is small. I even have the camera here, kind of more in the shot than I would usually do, because the game is like microscopic and I have to have it closer than usual uh, for it to look in focus. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a weird product. It's kind of something that I can't believe exists, and I think I like it a lot. I've actually not been the world's biggest Gloomhaven fan. I don't really love the semi co-op nature with kind of the the battle goals that sometimes pit you against your the best interest of the other players in your team. I compared to other dungeon crawlers like Imperial Assault and stuff. Like I miss dice. I love the highs and lows that dice bring. Uh, a number of other things. I feel like kind of the meta game of the the stickers and the the kind of the legacy game side of it of both Gloomhaven and Frosthaven. Although I haven't played Frosthaven, I've just watched videos. But it all seems kind of underwhelming to me. Anyway, uh, this one in a way solves all my issues with Gloomhaven. Like there's a die. <laughs> there's no battle goals. Uh, there isn't even leveling up. There are levels, but you just um, you play at the level that the scenario. Um, tells you to play at so you don't have to worry about experience or anything and hey there's no other players so I don't even have to worry about communication rules that kind of thing um, so I played the tutorial already I played it on live stream so you can actually check that out on the channel if you want to see it um, in like the live section of the optimal play YouTube channel uh, what that actually was was the it was a digital tutorial using the dies app that a bunch of Kickstarters and stuff have been partnering with. Um, it was fine. It was a little slow, especially once you were a few turns in and it kept repeating all the steps of the turn. And also it was really poorly acted by what I'm guessing was an AI voice. Uh, but other than that, like it was, an, it was a nice way to learn. Um, but I'm going to replay, since I the, the tutorial uses scenario one, so I'm about to replay it here. I've seen it once before, uh, but I'm playing it with a different character and the character that I wanted to um, play through the whole campaign with, I think, and that is the Mind Thief. I the, In the tutorial, they have you play as the Bruiser, but that's a low-complexity character. I've played Gloomhaven before. Uh, looking at we've got the Cragheart, the Spellweaver, the Tinkerer, the Silent Knife, and the Bruiser. Um, Three of them are considered low complexity, two of them consider are considered high complexity, and I had decided to thread the needle and play the only medium complexity hero. Mercenary, rather. It tells me the Mind Thief controls the battlefield through magic and manipulation. They also employ powerful psychic augments as they dance across the battlefield, slipping in to stab their unsuspecting foes. Um, it's not my usual playstyle. I actually like to be kind of tanky and uh, supportive in like dungeon crawler games but in a solo one i guess you kind of probably all these classes do a little bit of everything in a way oh well, we got some loud airplane noise i don't know if it's picking up uh so anyway we're gonna dive in with the mind thief and i'm going to show you how scenario one plays uh i am definitely i'm gonna definitely play through the campaign whether i'm gonna do it all on video i haven't decided yet so um let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more sweet gloomhaven buttons and bugs content uh, and that'll make me more likely to uh, continue playing on video and publishing it to the channel. So, oh, I should, also I should be a good YouTuber and say, um, speaking of publishing to the channel, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. It's the only way to help us out. There's no Patreon or anything for Optimal Play. So we really appreciate it when you hit those buttons, help us out. You can also, you know, leave our videos, play, leave a playlist playing in a muted in another tab. Uh, anything that juices those numbers for YouTube uh, is, is the main way to help us out. 
So I uh, appreciate it when you do that. Okay. Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs. It has a scenario deck. The entire game is basically in this deck. And it starts with that shrinking feeling. What a time for Gloomhaven. First, the black tornado from the void nearly destroyed the city. Then there were reports of the very essence of corruption trying to end everything. But all's well that ends well. At the center of both events, Hale, a mysterious ether who lives in a derelict tavern. Ether? A-E-S-T-H-E-R. I'm going to say ether because I do not know how to pronounce that. A mysterious ether who lives in a derelict tavern, the Crooked Bone. It is said she can turn anyone into a hero, exactly what you want to be. Sure, you don't have a lot of training, but put in front of the right adventure, you'd get the acclaim that's due to you. So, with that bold purpose, you step across the threshold of the Crooked Bone and... No, that's not right. Everything is growing. Why is the doorway so large? Why are you so small? Is this some sort of ether enchantment? You've been shrunk. And then it says, play scenario one. A rude welcome. All right, so we'll proceed to that. Got some fancy gear there. You whirl around, taking in your familiar yet unfamiliar surroundings. Your attention settles on a scruffy character behind you, luckily on par with your diminutive stature. Nice and shiny, like it's never been used. Hand it all over and I'll let you live. Well, that simply won't do. Your gear is unused. There's really only one solution for that. It tells us the monsters in Scenario 1 will be bandit guards, and the goal is to defeat all monsters. So without reading any further, we are going to flip this over. Here it is. This is the scenario map. We will be playing on this single card map with our tiny, teeny tiny Mind Thief Mini on this entry space. And then it shows us bandit guards on these two spaces. We've got a green and a blue cube to represent those. And we have green and blue, although uh, it's, not, it's not just the video, it is also very hard in real life to tell the difference between these, these four. I would say the red one is pretty distinct. These other three color-coded enemy dials, very difficult to tell apart, but we've got a green one, number one, a blue one, number two. They both start at eight hit points. Uh, the other features of this map are these uh, green hexes with art on them. Those are obstacles. You can't move, uh, can't move into them or through them, but you can fire range attacks through them. Same goes for the enemies. And then there's two little red um, hazards, and they have one damage printed right on them. If something enters that space, then it takes one damage. But uh, if you've played Gloomhaven, you're familiar with like traps. Uh, the monsters kind of work the same way, where they go, they avoid it at all, at almost all costs. But they pretty much only move through one if it's the only way that they could attack you that turn. So uh, probably will only be doing that if I can get them in myself. Luckily, I'm the mind thief. I think that I will be taking some turns for the monsters, uh, manipulating them a little bit, that type of thing. So that should be uh, should be cool. Um, You'll notice there's no decks of modifiers. We have these little modifier tables. We, each time we need one, when I attack or when the monsters attack, we're gonna roll this die. It's a D3. It has uh, two, two copies each of three sides, a plus, a minus, and a, uh, the tutorial called it the neutral symbol, an O, a zero, um, whatever you wanna call it. The, you'll roll that and then refer to the table right here. Minus is terrible. That means I would have a minus one modifier on my attack. And then you move this down and it kind of cycles through the table multiple times. So uh, you can only miss on that third row and you can only crit on that fifth row, at least with the basic table. Something that I actually I think is really, uh, really actually kind of sold me on this system is, and let me find the Mind Thief ones. Uh, as you level up, this table gets replaced with better versions that add extra effects that tie into how the character works, all that stuff. And it's unique to each character, and there's one for every level. So uh, I actually think that that system is super cool. And then also, instead of enemy, uh, like monster decks that dictate their actions, you'll roll that same die and determine which of three columns they act in. So these bandit guards have eight hit points, have one shield all the time, and uh, sometimes a shield, a second shield, if they take that minus action. And then the main other thing to note is 
Uh, I've got four action cards. They look like you're familiar with from Gloomhaven. They have a top and a bottom. I'll be choosing two of them and resolving the top of one card and the bottom of another and the initiative of the one of my choice. Uh, but the, there's only four of them. The first time you play them, they go back to your hand, flipped over to their B side. And then it's only when you play the B side that they get discarded. And then very similar to Gloomhaven, the um, shorter long rest, all that stuff is, is basically the way you remember it. Okay, so taking a look at my A side options for the Mind Thief, uh, Parasitic Influence. Uh, it's funny. I'll definitely be learning uh, the strategy for this game as, as I go, but the there's several cards that, like you would see in Gloomhaven, you can leave in play. Active, ongoing abilities. Uh, and they sit there until... In this game, um, they generally don't get lost. They sit there until you choose to discard them, or return them from your to the B side of your hand if they're an A side. But it is so... Um, costly to have 25% of your hand sitting in the active section that I'm slightly worried about it. But, um, I guess we'll see. So anyway, Parasitic Influence. After each of your attack abilities, perform a heal to self, um, and then also on this attack you get, or when you play this, you get a two attack. Uh, the bottom half, control an enemy within range 3 to move, have it move two spaces. Hey, it can move them into the hazards there. Withering Claw, two damage melee attack that adds poison and muddle, which do the same things you think they do from Gloomhaven. Uh, the bottom half of that is an immobilize and a move. The Mind's Weakness, another active card. Add a plus one attack to, eat, to all your attacks, and it attacks for two. Or the bottom half is just an attack two that wounds... Or scurry, move three and attack two, or move three and then muddle all, uh, move three with a jump rather, and muddle all adjacent enemies. Okay, well there's just the two enemies, so I don't really see myself trying to like line up a lot of AOE muddling, and I'm not really seeing much reason to control an enemy straight off. I think I want to probably just get towards one and start attacking and away from the other. So like a scurry and the mind's weakness to move and attack and then attack and wound, like that feels pretty good to me. I think that's what I will play to start. Um, I can either go faster than they can possibly go or slower than I can possibly go. Um, actually, that's this is interesting. I could try to be where neither of them could get to me at the end of the turn? Well, if they move one, neither of them could get to me already. I have to make my de my uh, decision about initiative before I roll to see what their initiative will be. So, the one movement would mean neither of them can get to me, which is really cool. But maybe I just want to charge in, stay away from one, and just pummel the other. That probably... That should be the safe bet. Oops, I still have my hit point dial hit set to 12 from when I was playing the Bruiser and the Jorial. Mind Thief only gets 10 hit points. Significantly squishier. Okay, so I'm going to choose fast. I'm going to plan to just scurry in and start stabbing uh, one of the guards. Okay, so rolling the die for their action. It's the minus. Okay, so they are also going fast. They're moving two and adding one shield to themselves, so I'm um, really glad, actually, that I decided to go first. Because that extra shield would have hurt, but I get to get in before it. So, I'm going to just scurry up to... Um, I think I'm going to scurry towards the green one, because that's on next turn. If I want to take a force it to move, I can push it into the hazard. So, I will move up to three, just two spaces with scurry. Really tiny, you gotta like use your, your operation hands here. Really tiny board. <laughs> uh, and attack two. So, uh, attacking the green bandit guard for two, and I'm gonna roll to see whether I get a minus one, a zero, or a plus one modifier. And it's a minus one, ouch, okay. So I'm attacking for one, and they have one shield, so I accomplish nothing. That's not great. But then I'll do the bottom half of the mine's weakness. Another attack for two, oh, we'll move this down. 
Another attack for two and a wound. So, another minus. Jeez. We're off to a bad start. Uh, so that did no damage, but it will wound the green guard. Uh, wound makes them suffer one damage at the start of each turn until they get healed, which uh, they don't have a way to heal themselves, so they are probably not getting healed. So with that, these are, and actually these should have been um, flipping and returning to my hand as I resolve them, which is important because any elements on these cards are active to be consumed. Uh, and that, even the ones that are in my hand also. And so that means like when I flip this, Okay, there's no element on it. But had there been an element, I could have immediately consumed it with that card if that card wanted it. Those are the types of combos uh, that are a little different in this one that you can try to plan out. Oh, like this one generates knight. So now, since this is in my hand, knight is active. Uh, if I find a way to spend it, darkness I should say, not knight. Um, I don't think I have a card that spends it. That's a little bit weird. I don't see, I don't see any card that... Uh, that uses darkness. Oh well. <laughs> it's their turn. Uh, they go in numerical order, so starting with the green guard, it's gonna move two, it doesn't need to. It's uh, going to attack for one, and uh, oops, I should have moved my modifier track down since I rolled again. Uh, they are going to modify that with a minus, uh, so that modifies it down to zero, we'll take that. The blue, uh, and it applies one shield that isn't gonna matter since I already took my turn. Blue Bandit acts next, moves two spaces towards me. Can't attack. Shield doesn't matter. Okay, with that, fresh new turn. So my options have changed. They have not reduced yet. Uh, I have two more A's, this Withering Claw and Parasitic Influence. And I have Into the, into the Night, which is an attack that says plus, or three attack, plus two for each negative condition the target has. Speaking of negative condition, the green one should have lost a hit point from its wound. And the Gnawing hard, uh, Horde can stay active, turning on a 2 Retaliate with a Metal attached to it, and a shield. Or you can use it to move 4. Um, that's all pretty cool. I think End of the Night, just trying to slaughter a guard, seems like the play. So I'm going to do End of the Night, but I don't know if I'm necessarily going to do uh, Gnawing Horde. Because I also could do something like Parasitic Influence, controlling an enemy within three, which could go after them and send the blue one back it up into that hazard. Or I could just try to like finish off the green by pushing it into the hazard. I think I like that. I think I'm going to play Into the Night and Parasitic Influence. And you know, yeah, just finishing one off by, by potentially pushing it into the hazard and then its wound can finish it off. That all feels really good, so I am going to go on seven initiative. Roll for them. It's the minus, I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> I think I've rolled a minus on every roll of this D3 so far. That's very weird. Uh, okay, so they're gonna do the same thing. They're gonna move to attack one and shield one, but I am going first again with my fast initiative. So, end of the night, the green guard has a negative condition, so it's going to attack for a total of five. Here we go. Uh, hopefully not another minus, that would be a miss. There it is again! All right, hang on, let me test this die. There, okay, roll a zero, a zero. Is it capable of rolling a plus? A zero, a plus. All right, I think it's just dumb luck. <laughs> I don't like, I have this tray here because uh, it's too easy to knock this little card around. Hmm, okay. I miss entirely. That's brutal. And then Parasitic Influence, I can control an enemy within range 3, which does means it's got to be the green one. And then I can move 2, actually, so I could make it so the green one won't attack me. Oh, no, no, sorry, control it, and it moves 2. So it would get to move back, it would, it would get it back in range to attack me. No, if I push it through this hazard, it would take the long way back around. Oh, I'm, I'm incredibly smart. Okay, I'm going to move it too, into the hazard. It takes one damage, and it's going to keep moving. And then, that's it for my turn. So into the night is discarded. Parasitic influence gets flipped to possession and is back in my hand. And I have frost for what that's worth. There's frost on the other side of my withering claw, so maybe I 
do something with that. It's their turn. The green one acts first. It's going to move two spaces the long way back to me to not go back through the hazard. Blue one will move two towards me. Green one takes the damage from its wound. Uh, overall, kind of annoying that it's the blue guard that is in my face. <laughs> but we'll see what we can do here. Fresh new round. I have three cards to do something with. Withering Claw can is an attack with that poisons and muddles. Um, muddling the blue guard feels pretty good. And it would flip over to the one that, so if I hold on to possession, then I will have Frost for this Empathetic Assault. You know what though? I kind of think that this possession is too incredible to not just play right now though. Control an enemy within range 4 to have it move to and attack 3 and muddle. I can do that with the green one, and then the blue one would be muddled. Yeah, I've got to just play that. I don't think that the upside of, of a disarm when I consume Frost is going to... Is, is going to be more powerful than that is right now. So I want to do that with the top, and then... The bottom card will probably just be... Withering Claw, which disarms something. Okay, all right, all right. I think I see, I have a plan here. All right, let's watch this. Uh, I'm gonna, these are both faster than the bandits can possibly go. So I will be going before them, but we will roll to see what they do. It's a minus, go figure. Okay, so. With possession, I can control an enemy within four, have it move two, and attack three and muddle. So if I move the green guard back here, it blocks the blue guard from getting to me this turn. And then the bottom half of my withering claw, oh and yeah, can immobilize it and move away, and I just won't get attacked this turn. That feels great. So I'm gonna do that. I'll, I'll do what I what I just did. Guard uh, moves two through the other guard towards me and then attacks three so the green guard is attacking the blue guard for three damage uh, and and muddling the blue guard so we'll put that muddle down and their modifier is going to be a zero so zero so it attacks for three uh, the blue guard has one shield so it's going to take two damage all right that is Possession. That was a B-side card, so that is discarded. Bottom half Withering Claw is going to immobilize something within one space. So there we go. Uh, and this removes at the end of next turn, so... No, that's gotta be, that's gotta be their next turn, right? Meaning it's coming up. I don't think it. I don't think it lasts to, to, through next round. They just they just lose one move. <laughs> I'm just just thinking that through. Okay. And then I can move three. I am just going to take a step. I don't really want to be in this corner, so I'll move there. Hey, I just noticed that these miniatures are literally standing on buttons. I don't know how well that plays on camera, but it's adorable. This game is so cute. Okay, so that's it. That's interesting. Man, I have two conditions on there now. If I had had my uh, end of the night, I could really blow that card up. But I don't, I guess, so that's fine. Oh, I actually got to move their track down. We used their modifier there. Withering Claw gets flipped. I have two cards left, limited options next turn, uh, and then I can rest the turn after that. Okay, they're minus. Um, the green guard is... Oh, my! by moving away... Let me... S Sorry, I'm not going to move. I forgot I disarmed it. Slight backup. Nothing changes. I'm just not moving. Because now the green guard goes... Um, no, 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 it's immobilized. Shoot, not... Did I do this right? Yeah, it's immobilized, not disarmed. That's what I was confused. I was thinking that it wouldn't be able to attack. Okay, it's immobilized, so yeah, I will move. Hmm. 
I'll move a space away. The green one is immobilized, so it can't attack me. It loses a health to its wound. The blue one, and it's immobilized, will go away. The blue one does get to come in. Moving two. It's going to attack me for one with disadvantage from its muddle. So we're going to roll this die twice. A neutral and a negative. So it's going to miss. You love to see it. Okay, that's the top of a new round now. Its muddle is gonna be gone. What can we do here? Empathetic Assault is just a smack for three, and the bottom half of Gnawing Horde is... Hmm. I wonder if I should actually put up this Retaliate and Poison Gnawing Horde for the turn. And then you can discard them any time. So I guess I could put make this active discard at the end of the round going into my rest turn. I think that's pretty good, actually. Okay. Which would leave me just doing the move on Empathetic Assault. I'm not sure I want to move. I think I want to retaliate and poison them. So I've got 10 health. They're not going to not gonna kill me too hard. Okay, uh, I'm going to go first so I can turn on that Retaliate uh, using the 11 initiative on Empathetic Assault, and then we'll roll to see what they do. They're going to their middle column. I cannot roll a plus on this to save my life. I was rolling them when I did the tutorial, I swear. Okay. My turn. I'm going to turn on Gnawing Horde, putting it in my active section. This gives me two Retaliation, my Retaliate's Poison, and I have one Shield. That seems great. And then the bottom half of Empathetic Assault is just move to heal to self. I don't think I want to move because I want them to attack me and get retaliated on. And I can't heal. I'm full. So that is just discarded. And then it's their turn. Green Guard is going to go first. Oh, I didn't think this through. I thought they'd both get to attack me, but they ended up with the only position that gives them only one. Uh... Only one attack, so or sorry, only one space of movement. And they go in numerical order, meaning green, which is number one, can't move, can't get to me. So it's just going to lose a health, and that's it. Blue doesn't need to move, will attack me for two. So they rolled a minus, two minus one, and I have my shield. I won't take any damage, but I'll retaliate for two and poison the blue guard. That seems great. So, how am I handling this rest now? My gnawing horde is still in play. I could leave it there. Do I think, if I just recover two cards, then I essentially have two more turns. Well, but then I could eventually send Gnawing Horde into the discard pile, and then the next time I rest, get two cards back again. Yeah, I think that's good. I think I'll just short rest. Let's see how this goes. Short rest, like in the Gloomhaven you know and love, means that I will lose one at random, and I could one time take damage to draw again. So I am shuffling under the table here. Let's see what card I lose. Well, I dropped one on the floor. That'll be the one I lost. That's fitting. Ugh. The Mind's Weakness. Okay, so this is the one that um, wounds. It's the one that I used. Oh, it's the one that has Into the Night on the back, which is that powerful attack. So it's a shame to lose that, but... Such is life. Okay. So, my turn here, then. I have two cards. Parasitic Influence and Withering Claw. Parasitic Influence could... Also, well, Withering Claw is just going to do a muddling attack, and muddling and poison attack. That seems great. And Parasitic Influence says after each of your attack abilities, perform a two self heal. Shouldn't really matter. Yeah, these are fine. Wow, lots of uh, I don't know how much that's picking up on the mic. Lots of like helicopter traffic around my place here. Living in uh, Valley in LA, <laughs> the cops love to fly those helicopters. Okay. So I'm going to play these. I have been... Going first has been doing well for me, so I'm going to choose the 18 initiative so that I will get to go before the bandits, but they will stay in their neutral column. Okay. 
I will start with Withering Claw against the Blue Bandit. Two attack. It will apply poison, but it's already poisoned. And it will apply Muddle, so I'll throw that out there. Although with a plus one here and the poison... No, I guess because of their shield I won't quite be able to kill it, but here we go. It's a minus, so a minus one. Alright, so two minus one. Plus one from the poison, we're back up to two. Minus one from the shield, it's one damage. Not as good as I would have liked. And then I will use the bottom half of Parasitic Influence. Control one enemy within range three to uh, move it to. Mm. You know what? I want them attacking me. I'm just going to win if they do because I have this retaliate. So I am actually going to move the green card in so that it doesn't get stuck like it did last round. I'm just going to let them wail on me and that should pretty much take them out. Okay, these will both go back to my hand, flipped. Which, hey, next turn, I have Frost and Empathetic Assault, which consumes Frost. So if there even is an next turn at this rate, uh, that's going to feel good. Okay, the bandits are going to act on 50. They, the green one doesn't need to move to attack me. It will attack me for two. Rolling, oops, I need to move my modifier down the track. Rolling their modifier. This is the one where they can crit. This could hurt. Uh, they don't, though. I roll yet another minus. Minus one. And I have one shield, so we're down to zero, and I will retaliate for two. And the wound did one to them. The green bandit is dead. Uh, the blue one is next. It's muddled, so it's got disadvantage. It's rolling twice here. Attack me for two. Plus, there's finally, finally rolled a plus, at least. It's possible. And a minus, though. That's a minus two. That'll reduce their attack to zero. And then I'll retaliate for two. <laughs> Seems real good. Uh, I can clear that wound because that is dead. Okay, well, it's it's uh, one more round, but should be... We'll also clear muddle, huh? Should be an easy cleanup here with possession and empathetic assaults. Um, they both go before any of the bandits, so initiative won't really matter. We'll see what their play is. It's the neutral column again. They're going to try to move one attack too. Okay, I can simply... Empathetic Assault. Attack it for three, using the Frost to also disarm it on the off chance that it survives. It won't get to hit me. Although if it did, I would retaliate. Maybe I won't, won't even opt to disarm it. <laughs> Let's just roll for the Empathetic Assault. That'll probably finish it off. Sorry, they should be back up at the top of this track from when they went. This is also one where I could crit. I might just splatter this dude. Okay. Empathetic Assault, attack for three. It's a neutral. We'll take it. That's a plus zero. So three. Minus one from their shields, two. Plus, from their, for, plus one from their poison is three. They only have one hit point. They're dead. And that was it. That was what? Was that, that was four? Uh, no, I guess you would always rest after four turns, pretty much, right? Because you had eight, eight cards front and back of four. Um, quick rest and then two more turns. So that was six turns? And given how quickly you lose your cards, it seems like it's a maximum of not that much more than that. This game definitely plays quick. Whew, and that whiskey's good. Okay, let's see what happens. We're gonna go back to the scenario. Well, your gear certainly isn't shiny anymore, and it wasn't even particularly fancy to begin with, come to think of it. Got the job done at least, but your situation is quite dire. You'll need to survive long enough to find out how to restore yourself to original size. But for now, you'll need to deal with the vermling that just appeared. Read the Collector. And we've got this full art character, the Collector. Took out the scavengers, I see, the vermling offers. You're not the first to barge in on the hall, or on hail, and get this less than ideal result. We've all been there. Some of us have realized the need to work together if we're to make the best of this. I assume you'd like to be big again? You nod. Then I have a proposal for you. During my time here, I've collected things that may be useful. You may borrow them, and in exchange, I will accompany you so I may expand my collection. I can also tell you that your best hope for escape is getting into the crooked bone and taking the issue up with Hale. Unfortunately, you look behind you to see the door is now firmly closed. Yeah, the only way in is through Button's Kingdom, across the road. Come on! You can now equip items during scenario setup. 
And the next step is play Scenario 2, Crossing the Road, which uh, that will be on a separate video coming soon to the channel. But first, wow, that helicopter is noisy. Sorry. But first, let's take a look at items, because we didn't have any in Scenario 1, but now my understanding is all of the cards in the Scenario deck that we've passed are items that we have access to. You can uh, take two hands worth of items that have hand symbols on them and one trinket, but that is uh, increased to half the scenario level rounded up, right? Yes, yes, so it's when we get to scenario level three that we can start taking two trinkets. So let's take a look at what these are. Uh, way back on the prologue card, we got a bottle cap helm, a card that you can exhaust during an enemy's attack, treat its plus attack modifier as a neutral attack modifier. So you can exhaust this to do that, and on a long rest, you get this item back to use again, I believe. The other side of the card is Sparrow Skull Helm. During your attack, gain advantage. So whichever uh, one you would want to do, like, um, I'm pretty squishy, so I think I like the Bottle Cap Helm. I would just tuck under my character, something like this. And then when you exhaust the card, you kind of have to, like, take it out from under your character and go like this. It's a little wonky, honestly, like a little fiddly, but I guess it gets the job done. Okay, we also have, from the Scenario 1 card, a Rose Thorn Knife, a hand slot card that says, during your attack, use Frost or Earth to add one piercing. Uh, I know I can generate Frost, so that seems pretty good. Or the other side is Venomous Fang, during your melee attack, add poison. I feel like I'm already poisoning enough that this is definitely the Rose Thorn Knife is the call here. And then the collector card itself gives me shrunken weathered boots. During your movement, add plus one movement when you exhaust this. Or old spring. During your turn, add jump to all your movement. Ooh. That would have... I mean, I've only seen the one scenario, but that would have gotten me out of that corner had I wanted to. I think I like the old spring. Uh, but I will only be bringing in one of these trinket cards... So I will have to decide on a scenario by scenario basis whether I want the Bottle Cap Helm or the Old Spring. Or I think this is not a permanent decision. I think I can just also use the other side of the card at will. Okay, that's scenario one of Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs. Uh, I'm definitely going to keep playing it. Let me know whether you enjoyed this video, and that will affect how likely I am to play a lot of the campaign on video. Otherwise, it might just be the first couple scenarios and then uh, continuing on my own time from there. But I will definitely be back for another one, so if you would hit that subscribe button, like the video as well, uh, those are pretty much the only ways to help Optimal Play grow the channel. So we appreciate it. And uh, I'll be back soon to see what more uh, the buttons and bugs have in store for us. Till then, be optimal.